Welcome to this video on market anomalies. It should, in all sincerity, be called other market anomalies because we've already had a video, the previous one to this, uh, where we discussed uh, time series and cross-sectional um, anomalies. So this is the follow-up video. Um, if this is your first encounter with the Let Me Explain YouTube channel, then I hope you'll find this video interesting and you'll subscribe to the channel and perhaps you'll even consider becoming a member, uh, a supporting member, to, to get access to all the videos that are available on the channel. A lot of them are hidden uh, and available only to supporting members. Okay, let's get cracking with these anomalies. These are, you know, at least the first couple of ones you should really know for the exam. Um, okay, the first one is the closed end investment fund discounts anomaly and this relates to a very specific effect that you can see in the market I'm going to show you an example of it as well uh, which relates to closed end funds only so closed end funds are those funds which uh, initially at the start of their life they issue a fixed uh, number of shares those shares are bought by investors, of course, for money. And um, the fund then has the money necessary to go and make investments in line with its uh, chosen policy. However, those shares which have been acquired by the initial investors that are in the primary market subsequently trade in the secondary market. Shares trade with, okay, obviously, these investors trade with other investors. The shares of the fund trade in um, the secondary market on an exchange. Okay, and at any point in time, you can observe what the share price is here for one sort of share of the fund, but we also, on a regular basis, typically daily, compute the net asset value as pertaining to the fund's investments, so the NAV per share. And in theory, you know, because these shares represent um, ownership, or, you know, give you a claim to the assets of the fund proportionately, there shouldn't really be much of a difference between the NAV on a per share basis, i.e. the value of what the fund holds, as divided by the number of shares it has issued, uh, relative to the price of the, at, at which the shares trade in the market. But, on average, we observe that over here, um, shares of closed-end funds, so obviously these shares over here, trade at a discount to NAV. Let me show you an example of this. I've, I've opened up uh, the website of BlackRock, one of the world's biggest sort of fund providers, front fund managers, and I've selected over here closed end funds only. Let's apply the selection. And over here, you've got a very long list of uh, closed end funds, um, they, which are sort of using American convention referred to as typically as trusts. But please appreciate that over here there's a column labeled premium or discount and you know wherever we look at least those initial ones okay with some minor exceptions but you typically see a number uh, that's preceded by uh, the minus sign meaning these things actually trade well not all of them but most of them trade at some discount to their uh, nav i mean if you click on the first one the BlackRock uh, Innovation and Growth Term Trust, whatever it is, um, then, you know, I'm shooting this video on the 31st of October 2024, so you have NAV data from the previous day. So yesterday, from the perspective of when I'm shooting this video, the value of the assets held by the fund was $8.47 on a per share basis, but the price at which those shares were actually trading was significantly lower, uh, you know, uh, this representing a discount of 9.68%. Uh, well, quite big, quite significant, and as you saw, this wasn't an isolated case. So, um, 
you know, your book says this is a common thing, and uh, let's think of some possible explanations for it. Explanations. Um, well, it could be that uh, the lower share price is reflective of management fees. After all, you know, uh, you pay the manager to manage uh, the the fund, and therefore the shares of the fund will be priced lower than what the fund actually holds because of the fee effect. Or it could be reflective of expected manager performance. Uh, in this case, not really reflective of good expected performance, but pretty bad. But that was a very uniform effect, so it can't be the full explanation. Um, your book says this could happen for tax reasons, tax treatment, right, differences, that kind of thing. Or it could be also to do with liquidity issues, liquidity problems. Um, what we mean by this is, you know, when you um, when you compute NAV, net asset value, you take um, you take the value of each um, each asset on a sort of per share basis, and you uh, use those share prices to compute the value of the whole um, closing share prices to compute the value of the whole. Uh, fund holding that may not really be reflective of the true value of that holding given limited liquidity in the market now all of these are plausible explanations but your book says none of them really exhaust the uh, really um, are, are big enough good enough to explain the whole discount so this still remains something of an anomaly or a um, an enigma which may potentially be explored, right, potentially. Uh, okay, so that's the first anomaly. The second one is earnings surprises. So we've had the closed end uh, fund discounts and now earnings surprises. Um, when a company announces its earnings, assuming there's a bit of surprise, i.e. those earnings are better or uh, worse than expected, there will be what they call an unexpected portion of those of that earnings announcements, an earnings announcement. announcement. Obviously the unexpected bit is by how much the earnings were better than expected or worse than expected. And indeed this unexpected portion should be a reason to cause uh, some price adjustment. Uh, the expectations should already have been factored into the price, but this should cause a price adjustment. But wait, it should be a rapid critically price adjustment, sort of instantaneous. We know the earnings, we see the bit of surprise there, whoops, the price goes up or the price goes down to account for this. At least this is what should happen if you trust the semi-strong form of market efficiency uh, where uh, prices should be reflective of all information that is already known, that's current information, right? Uh, and this, these, once earnings are announced, they become information that's publicly available. Okay, however, various studies conducted in various markets, so let me say studies have shown uh, obviously studies, empirical studies based on market data, that the adjustment, which is supposed to, you know, be reflective of the surprise element, that adjustment is absolutely not always um, all that rapid. It's not always all that efficient. It doesn't happen instantaneously. Prices keep on adjusting after the announcement so it's not a pop or a drop and then things are stable that thing kind of trickles through and trickles through and uh, that kind of goes against semi-strong form efficiency uh, and potentially investors may exploit it right uh, if it's persistent as it seems to be now uh, 
the next anomaly refers to IPOs, initial public offerings. In an initial public offering, what you've got to, you know, what, what's happening is a company is selling shares, but it's using an investment for typically a whole sort of syndicate of investment banks to offer those shares to investors. And the investment banks involved, what they typically do is they underwrite the offer, meaning they guarantee that the offer will be successful and if any shares remain unsold, they have to kind of pay for those shares and buy them themselves. So when investment banks set the selling price, advise the company and on setting the selling price for the shares, they typically don't aim for the most ambitious of targets because that increases the likelihood that they'll have to buy those shares themselves. Instead, uh, they set the selling price, selling price of the shares typically too low so as to reduce the risk of having to um, pay, buy any of those shares themselves. And this, the fact that this becomes too low, then often leads, now this is by no means universal, but often yields to a pop in the stock price on the first day, uh, the first day day, trading day, price uh, pop, which is that you know, very quick increase in the, in, the, in the price sometimes. So what could be gleaned from this is that if you participate, participating in an IPO as one of the sort of primary buyers, as one of the buyers who buys directly via the investment banks from the issuer or from the investment bank who's the intermediary here, may indeed uh, generate the possibility for abnormal returns. Um, because that price is often too low and it will quite quickly adjust to the true intrinsic value. However, you know, I think more recent experience shows that uh, that's not universally the case. Sometimes the price is actually set very ambitiously and instead of having a first day increase, you've got a first day drop. Uh, yeah, um, it's a mixed experience, I, I would say, but if you did it on a large enough scale, in large enough basis, maybe you would get this continuous or repeating uh, abnormal return. Um, another one that you that your book talks about is the predictability of returns based on prior information. And this isn't really that much of an anomaly itself as more of a sort of general note that the returns on equities, equity returns, are to some extent related to past information, so historic information. Things like the level of interest rates or um, stock market volatility or for that matter dividend yields. And that shouldn't really matter so much if, um, if the markets are efficient. I mean you know, even under weak form efficiency, you shouldn't be able to make abnormal returns if you just use historic information. So the fact that there is a link here, um, at least some, some evidence suggests that there is, points to the fact that there is, uh, goes against uh, market efficiency. Now, very importantly, is it possible to make money by exploiting these anomalies, these ones as well as the ones we discussed in the previous video on time series and cross-sectional anomalies. Well, your book says, um, in theory, yes, but in practice, it's going to be difficult. Why? Because a lot of these anomaly, anomalies that are found in the market, not necessarily these ones, which are quite persistent, actually um, result from um, the statistical sort of data approach that we use to find that uh, to find that anomaly and once you correct the approach your sort of your modeling approach 
very often those anomalies stop appearing in the data. So, uh, you know, that's difficult because often the approach to finding them is false or wrong. And um, it has a special, or your book has a special note on overreactions. They say, yes, overreactions do occur, like we mentioned uh, previously, but so do underreactions. So, in effect, it's, it's a mixed bag. And maybe the market isn't efficient all the time, but on average it is, because for some events there will be, or some news, there will be overreaction. Uh, in other cases, there will be underreactions. So when you put things together, on average, things, to, things do seem to work efficiently. And it's very hard to guess where you're going to have an overreaction and when you're going to have underreaction, plus a lot of these anomalies wouldn't really generate you abnormal returns once you factor in transaction costs. So uh, that's another very important reason why it would be difficult to, ex or it is difficult to exploit them in practice.